when you take someone who's outside the discipline, they start asking these basic questions that can actually break down those dogmas, and then you start questioning the you know how the entire field was was um, evolved. You know, like th- there's like this kind of framework, and you start breaking down that framework, and you realize that there's completely new ways of thinking that that could be helpful. So I think just in, as a general kind of principle in life, it's it's you know surrounding yourself with people who have expertise and skills that you don't have. How do you create a super-powered problem-solving team? Welcome to this classic episode of Spartan Up. Here are three stories about creating and building powerful problem-solving teams in business, football, wrestling, and biochemistry. You'll hear from Jen Welter, the first female coach in the NFL, from Kevin Ward, the wrestling coach at West Point, and from scientist and entrepreneur Jeff Karp. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Trifecta. Trifecta delivers delicious, macro-balanced meals directly to your door. Use the code SPARTAN at trifectanutrition.com to save 40% off your first meal plan order. Jen Welter turned what some perceived as weakness into her strengths. And she talks about what it takes to make a solid, outstanding football team. Diversity is strength. Explain that. You know, to me... Uh, football is the ultimate place where you see that play out. When you look at a football field, you have people of every shape, size, make, model, cream, color. You have everything from pure muscle to pure hustle working together, 11 people, very different strengths, all having to come together in a perfectly choreographed dance for any play to work, right? It doesn't work if they all look the same. So I think we forget that sometimes, right? We're, We're here in Boston. You got Tom Brady, right? Obviously, first ballot Hall of Famer, one of the best to ever play the game. But do you think you'd win with 11 Tom Brady's? Good point. No, right? You need one. And so as coaches, you know, when we're building a team, you have to find out what makes your your players great, what skills they have, right? Um, And then pair them up. That's right. And put them in a position where they're going to be the most successful, Right. That's your job. And then to bring the best out of them by creating a unified vision. Right. So you're unified in your vision and your goals, but your talents and what you bring to the table are fundamentally different and realize that that's an asset. Right. And so it's the same way with people. Right. If you're in a boardroom, um, I like to say that, you know, diversity is a strength is kind of like a diamond. Right. Diamond on the street is like a rock. You would just kick it down the street and not even know any better. But the true brilliance and the beauty of that diamond is brought when you reveal each individual facet and let it capture the light in a, in a different way, yeah. right? So wouldn't you want the same to be the brilliance of your company, right? And letting- Or family, or that's any, right. any, any, right. any team. Right, and letting them see things in a different way and bring things to a different table and realizing that without any of them or without one, you're not truly capturing the entire brilliance, right? And so that's why I say it's not only strong, right, because we're better together, but it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful in its diversity. Um, And part of that, the other thing we were talking about, as I said, like, why fit in when you can stand up and stand out? That was something that I really learned because there was nobody I could be like, right? There was nobody I could look at and say, I'm going to coach like her or I'm going to be like her. No road to follow. And so I think a lot of people, when they're the different one, they look at a scenario and then they try and just fit in, right? Like, don't don't stand out too much. Don't Don't make any waves. Don't. And then you're losing that brilliance, right? Like I knew going in, right? These guys all there. I was never going to outman a man at being a man. And frankly, they didn't need another man. They needed me. They needed my experience coming up through the women's game. They needed the fact that I was 5'2 and always undersized. So I had to fight harder and be more of a a technique technician because I was never going to just straight out you know, out big somebody, unless they're like 10, but 10 year olds now are getting big. Um, and so to bring that to the equation and the different vantage point that I had too, you know, I had a master's in sports psychology and a PhD in psychology. And I knew that I could communicate 
with the guys in a different way than maybe some of the male coaches could, right? So I always lovingly said, you know, you see in football, just picture the visual, you have a, a big coach and a big player and they're kind of eye to eye and toe to toe and they're kind of going at it. I mean, we get loud in football, that's just part of the game. Well, I could go toe to toe, but I was certainly not gonna be eye to eye. I was gonna be more eye to belly button. So you can't really like get real loud in that because he doesn't have to hear you. But any one of those guys could lean in for a whisper. So communication is a choice. So making it very personal, making it very one-on-one, -on -one, not focusing on calling them out, but being more like a, like a secret weapon. Um, what happens is then they want more from you. And so my approach was a little bit different in that, but it was something that, that they really respected. And so I always tell people like, be you, right? Be, own exactly who you are. Own the fact that your journey has made you and has formed you and, you know, and own that voice. Because if you are different and you see something different, that's an asset, not a liability, unless you don't bring your opinion to the don't equation. Hide it. Bring it don't out. hide it and don't try and mimic right. somebody else. It's an advantage. It is an advantage. Being different. I always say, like, what if everything that everyone told you was wrong along the way was actually what made you right? Yep. I was wrong in every way. I mean, I can tell you, as five foot two, 100 and maybe 30 pounds, nobody ever looked at me and said, you, should be you a will be, right, <laughs> you right. should be a football player. You're my first round draft pick. You'll be one of the best And a world. coach. Right. Never happened. And yet all of those things that made me wrong actually set me up to be the right person to do what I did. When we do these interviews, we're learning too. And one of the greatest lessons was from Kevin Ward, who explained that a culture is defined by the worst behavior it permits to continue. Here's what he says. I don't know what your opinion is, but one of the things we talk about in this parenting book is um, we just got too soft nationally. Uh, you yeah. know, obviously there's pockets of bricklayers. <laughs> Yeah. Here and there, but right, but, yeah. but just overall, like we're learning helplessness. I don't know what you're. I'm fortunate. I'm insulated from it. I mean, right. I get America's best at West Point to be able right. to work with, and uh, and I hear that kids these days, and we hear yeah. that quite a bit. My peers and in, in, in the coaching world, we hear that, you know, and I say that's bullshit. I've got 50 guys in this room that prove all of those stereotypes wrong. You know, I've got tough kids that aren't afraid to work, that want to serve, that want to do some pretty incredible things. So I'm fortunate. Maybe I'm not the expert to be talking to on that, sure. that topic. Cause no, I no, they self-selected. You've got a distilling process. You got the best of the best, right? Here, right. Yeah. But, but, but by and large, there's not a lot of parents that are making their kids work at 13 years old, mixing cement. It's, it, it, it's, it's very uncommon, you know, cause in the recruiting process, I see it. So if a kid tells me and you know, what are you doing this summer? If they're not training all summer for a major competition, not your kid, or if, or if they're not having a job, it's gotta be one of the two. You right. know, if you're if you're not working or if you're not really training for a major competition, we're probably not going to get along very well. Yeah. For the for the viewers out there and the yeah. listeners, uh, when I walked in, uh, Kevin had pointed out that there's no practice going on and uh, school's out. Uh, but yet the wrestling room was hot and full of kids. Yeah. And so he said, yeah, these kids are just coming in on their own. So I want to know what percentage are 20 percent playing at the lake or 10 percent at McDonald's. And he said, no, 100 percent of them are in the room. And so I was confused because he said, practice is over, right? And yeah. school's out, but yet all the wrestlers are in the room. So that just goes to show you the kind of kids you have. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So, well, if they want to be on the team very long, it's going to be 100%. Yeah. It's kind of an expectation. Yeah, so you, you're building a culture, or, or there is a culture here, I guess, uh, that just breeds that. Well, um, we could talk about that all day, Let's too. Talk, you yeah. know, I mean, I think, you know, I've got my philosophies and in that how I think about culture building and, and building an organization. Uh, for me, the organization is a wrestling team. It could be whatever else, but um, the culture's there. But if you don't sustain it, like every single day, it takes maintenance. Every hour of every day takes maintenance. If you, if, if you take it for granted, it's gone. And then you turn around and you're wondering, how did we get here? You know, and, right. and, and even though you didn't intentionally sabotage your culture, if you don't intentionally nurture it and grow it, then you're going to end up. So give me, give me some there. examples for that. Selfishly, I'm, uh, we, we grew from a little business to, you know, 500 people around the world. Yeah. And I do feel sometimes like, wow, I, I lost touch a little bit with the, 
42 countries and people everywhere. And, yeah. and, and, and so how do you do like, give me some tips on that. Well, I think, you know, my thought process is just, it's drip by drip, you know, and, um, I want, I, I visualize that I've got this bucket and I want to keep it full. And if I turn off the faucet, which is the communication, um, it's the discipline. If, if I stop putting these things in there, the culture runs dry. And so for me, it's just being intentional about having interactions with, I don't have 42 countries, you know, I barely have 42 individuals, but it's, it's having interactions with them on a daily basis. Hang on one second, we got some noise. So let's go back to those intentional things, communication, violent communication, in other words. I love that. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so what, every week? What, 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 what? Well, for me, it's that, you know, it's, when we have access to our guys daily, you know, yeah. I can talk to them before and after practice. Right. And, uh, and as, I, as a group, one as by a group. one? No, okay. as a group, as okay. a group. And, um, and I probably spend, not probably, I do, I spend as much time or more thinking about that five minute talk before practice and the five minute talk at the end is I do the whole two hours in between those. And now during the practice is when you're getting your individual interactions, you know, but what, what we're doing when we're talking to these athletes before a workout, a training session, whether it's on the mat or run a lift is we're teaching them how to think. We're teaching them how we think, what's acceptable, you know, what goes through your mind and as you're preparing for what's coming up. On a calendar, are you saying tomorrow my talk is going to be this or like do you prepare I'm those I'm not talks? that structured. Okay. I mean, for me, it's on my mind 100% of the time. I right. live it. And right. it's hard. I don't separate my work life from my life. I just, I love every That's bit so of it. so funny you said that because we, we just, we said, what could, what film could we do on the walking into West Point? And I had my whole family with him and I said, you know, everybody talks about separating work from, from your regular life. And I just meld it all together. I can't. Right. Yeah. I, I, I tried. I was in a different career for a little bit, but I just I love what I do too much. And, and are you married? Kids married? Three little kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So good. So I'm not crazy. At least there's another person. That yeah. Does well, you're not alone. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> we might both be crazy. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So so um, so communication. Mm -hmm. What else? I think um, the discipline. Most people think of discipline in, in negative connotations. I think discipline is just understanding the structure of what you do. Um, you know, discipline is freedom. You hear that a lot. Yeah, you know, yeah. when you follow a plan, you 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 have this freedom to to really be invested and involved in it without sure. distractions. Sure. So you're really free. So I think helping to create that discipline, um, and maybe one of the most important things I talk about a lot is it's it's what you praise and what you punish. And so praise is hugely motivating, and uh, but what you punish can also really dictate the direction that you're going. Most people. When they think of culture, think, OK, the highlights really dictate the culture. And in my personal belief, it's the opposite. I think what really shapes your culture are the worst behaviors that you allow. Whatever's right. the worst thing that you allow is what really shapes your culture. That's a great that's a great point. So if you don't if you don't immediately get rid of that stench, yeah, it could ruin the whole uh, kitchen. So at West Point, peer leadership is yeah. fundamental to what happens at West Point. You're supposed to be able to call out your peer without fear, or at least get over the fear of doing it. Yeah. Um, so if there's a certain standard and somebody's not meeting it, all right, they're down here and you don't call them out on it, what you've done is set a new standard right. by just not doing anything. Right. You have set a new standard that's lower than it was before. No different than allowing your kids to get away with things. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You've set new standards. Yeah. And so do you do you raise, the, do you continue to raise the standard? You sure hope. I mean, I, I would sure hope so. No, the standard... Not everyone's going to be able to reach a standard of performance that their teammate is going to be able to. Some sure. are better than others. Right. I think for me, it's more about expectation, uh, devotion. You know, how devoted are you to what you say that you want to do? Yeah. Um, how honest are you about what you want to do and what you're doing to achieve it? I think those things, I, hopefully there's not a finish line there. Yeah, hopefully we keep going. So, so, so communication, discipline. Yeah. What you praise and what you punish. What you praise and what you punish. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I coach, you know, 50 athletes that have really high goals and they're motivated to achieve them. Um, if I'm not motivated, I let them down. So for me, it's about being able to serve my athletes and, and help give them the experience that uh, that they came here for. It's interesting because um, you're motivating the athletes, but they're also motivating you. Like every day. Right. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so and so you're sitting out there on the couch. Find somebody. Yeah. Find somebody and say you're going to meet them at 7 a.m. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you got to show up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't let them down. No, I mean, having a, the, the greatest athletes in the world have coaches. Right. Right. Everybody right. needs somebody that can help push them. Absolutely. We'll be right back to this interview. But first, a quick message from Trifecta. We started Trifecta with a very singular mission to get America into shape. 
We were really interested in launching a business that was able to actually directly help people. That happened to be us helping with the chronic disease crisis that's caused by nutrition. We make it with organic ingredients, macro balanced meals, fully biodegradable packaging. Trifecta is here. Oh, yeah. We have an amazing company mission to help get America back into shape. Use the code SPARTAN at trifectanutrition.com to save 40% off your first meal plan order. Now back to the interview. Jeff Karp has succeeded by bringing together unique and powerful teams to solve great scientific and business problems. Here's how he thinks about it. What I've accepted is that, uh, you know, I like to work uh, on lots of different things and be continually learning about new areas that I don't know that much about and really be applying, I think, of engineering as a degree in problem solving. And um, it's really about, you know, there's maybe one or two percent of all the information in a particular field that's essential to know to solve a problem. Um, and then you need to surround yourself with the people who are experts in each of the disciplines. Um, and so it's learning to work with those people, but then also you know, applying a, a very rigorous problem solving strategy. And so we apply that to all kinds of different problems. So I, I wouldn't have guessed that. Is that, is that true? <clears throat> you only need 1% of knowledge in a particular area to solve a problem or, or is, is, are you just throwing that number out there? Yeah. I mean, the number, I, I don't know. I mean, the number we, we could kind of quibble over the, the, the exact number and I, I don't know, I don't know the exact number, but I mean, maybe another way of saying it that, um, that, that may be more closer to how, how it is, is um, I look at, I, I think, you know, we never fully understand a problem when we start working on it. And I think there's a tendency to jump right towards the solution based on taking the knowledge that we have available. And what I like to do is look at it as if we don't actually understand the problem um, for a while and we need to conduct experiments to better understand the problem. And if we do that, insights emerge that will guide us towards unique solutions. And so so I think for that process to occur, you don't need to know everything in a field. You need to be able to ask lots of questions and be able to identify the people who would be able to give answers um, and then also be able to construct models to, to test very specific you know, um, things that can guide you towards those unique insights that maybe others have overlooked. Give, a, give us a, a real life example, something that somebody watching or listening could, uh, could apply to their own life of, of, of a problem that they might not fully understand. Yeah. Um, so there are many potential examples. Um, not sure this is the best one, but um, one example is um, we were interested a number of years ago uh, in, uh, in brain cancer and trying to develop uh, a new approach. And it's one of these conditions where there's almost 100% um, uh, you know, chance that you're going to die within a year, year and a half, like glioblastoma is very aggressive type of cancer. And so, um, you know, we, we looked in the literature to try to better understand, you know, maybe an angle that we could take um, to make an advance. And so what I did is I made a, 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 I arranged a meeting with Patrick Wen, who directs the brain cancer trials at Dana-Farber. So he's one of the world leaders. And I said, start, just started asking lots of questions to him. And I said, you know, why, why haven't current approaches worked? Like, what, what do you think would be necessary in a, a future approach to really work well and he said I, I don't think the drugs are toxic enough um, and uh, and that's a big big problem that cells the cancer cells have the ability to you can knock them down but they have repair mechanisms and then they get back up and keep going um, and then I went and met with uh, Chuck Stiles who runs a, a basic uh, um, brain cancer lab at Harvard and I asked him the same series of questions and he said well you know there's there's one approach is um, to remove the primary tumor from the brain and then put these little wafers in to that space that can release drugs. But um, the drugs that are being used are not, um, you know, they're used in such small quantities and they don't, they don't diffuse into the brain very well. And uh, what we need is something like butter on buttered popcorn. We need that to perfuse through the brain because when metastasis occurs, you know, when the cancer comes back, um, it's coming back in lots of different places in the brain and, and that drug can't get to those places. It just doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't diffuse far enough. Um, and so those were that, so to me, that was kind of like breaking down the problem and really looking for insights that you may not get from reading the literature. And then through doing that, we were able to come up with an approach um, that could address those those challenges. And 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 so we and I could talk about the, the approach, but um, 
but but it's, it's that kind of thing, like really going and talking to the expert, experts and just asking lots of questions to really understand the problem to identify unique insights that may help drive a, a new solution. And and does it help when you have these uh, different expertise experts in your office? Right, uh, engineering backgrounds, different medical backgrounds. Does that help take a completely unique approach to once you've asked the question yeah, and you've yeah. got some answers, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in my laboratory, we have um, there's almost so I've tried to structure it so that we have almost no or minimal overlap in the expertise of the people in the lab. And so, what that does is, you know, because we just have people from all sorts of different backgrounds, we're sitting around a table brainstorming. Everyone can give a unique perspective. Um, you know, and others can't come up with it because they don't have that expertise. And then everyone feels validated um, because they're contributing to to a solution. And I think it, you know, it just creates this win win environment um, where. And, and I feel like when people feel validated and they're contributing, they're more willing to go all in. And uh, and that's really my goal is to create the conditions in the lab for people to go all in because we're trying to solve some really difficult problems. And the other element of it, I'd say, is that the lab is highly multicultural. We've had people from over 30 countries in the lab. And to me, that's important because everyone's education system, you know, different countries is a little bit different. People think differently. And so that means they're going to approach problems differently and they're going to come up with different ideas. And, and then there's also different problems in different countries that we may become aware of that we might, might uh, you know, have a go at. How many times have uh, somebody that's not um, in that particular space come up with a solution? Like an engineer comes up with a solution for cancer, for example, and that wasn't his field or her field. Yeah, I, you know, I think it happens all the time, and I, I think that uh, you know the, it, it's in, an inefficient process, and it could happen, you know, um, more. And I mean, my sense is that you know, when you're you're so deep into a discipline, um, you become sort of like uh, the, there's dogmas and there's things that you just start believing. And when you when, when you take someone who's outside the discipline, they start asking these basic questions that can actually break down those dogmas, and then you start questioning the you know how the entire field was was um, evolved. You know, like th there's like this kind of framework, and you start breaking down that framework, and you realize that there's completely new ways of thinking that that could be helpful. And so that's kind of my that's how I've tried to run my laboratory is that um, you know, and and it's actually very challenging, and it's very challenging because I feel like I'm always in a vulnerable position. I'm always. Um, you know, asking questions that I don't know the answer to. I, you know, it's not like I, I have all this knowledge and I'm just guiding people based on what I know. It's like we're constantly getting into new areas and and we're asking questions and, and, and you know, you feel insecure um, because you're going in this space. But I feel like it's like you just keep taking leaps of faith um, and, uh, and and surround yourself with, with kind of like-minded people, but people who can approach things from different backgrounds and, you know, all mission driven towards a common goal. Um, and I think that uh, you can make a lot of progress. So, so that's awesome. And I'm a big believer in it because it's happened in my life where I've come from one industry to another and it's clear as day for me. And I'm shocked that the people in the industry didn't see it. But um, how could those listening apply it to their lives? Like how could they, somebody said to me once, everybody should have their own personal board of directors, mm. right? With all different viewpoints, but uh, to help them see um, through the problems. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one, ex one example of something that we've done in my laboratory is, so for example, I really wanted to, to commit to not just making discoveries and then publishing them in papers and then it would end. I wanted to bring it to patients, but I know nothing about the business world or entrepreneurship. And so literally every two or three weeks, weeks since I started my, my faculty position, I've met somebody new in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, be it patent lawyers, corporate lawyers, reimbursement, regulatory Spartans. experts. Right? Spartans. <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, and it's, it's just, you know, people who can inspire you or people who have ability to navigate, you know, the entrepreneurial, um, you know, landscape. And then I develop relationships with those people. Like literally every two or three weeks, I've met somebody new over the last like 11 years or so and and so as and what that's been incredibly helpful for is as we're advancing projects I feel like we need to apply a filter to keep on track you know there's a lot of practical considerations about like you know can we get a patent or can we manufacture the technology or what's the regulatory strategy so it's like you know if you have 
experts that you have relationships with, you can ask the questions early on and, um, and, and engage. And then those people can also, they might be available to help you later. So I think just in, as a general kind of principle in life, it's, it's you know, surrounding yourself with people who have expertise and skills that you don't have and developing relationships with these people and and I think that that can really be you know if there's a certain mission that you have or a problem you're trying to focus on that can really be helpful to um to to achieve your goals and so I think and, and then the other piece of it I think is just like constant experimentation like constantly just trying to do new things and trying to identify like what really excites you what doesn't excite you and and you know using that as a way to make decisions about what you want to invest your time in next because i feel like aligning with your passions is is really leads to the most fulfilling life Thanks for listening to this classic episode of the Spartan Up Podcast. Remember, whatever task you're taking on, you will need resilience of mind, body, and spirit. And we're here to be your partner with reminders, techniques, and strategies three days a week to help you stay on track. Whatever app you listen in, click that follow button or that subscribe button to make sure you get notifications and you don't miss valuable information. See you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Trifecta. Trifecta delivers delicious, macro-balanced meals directly to your door. Use the code SPARTAN at trifectanutrition.com to save 40% off your first meal plan order. 